Are you 100% comfortable at your drum set? If your answer to that question isn't a resounding, yes, Steven, I absolutely am 100% comfortable at my kit, 100% of the time, day and night, morning and afternoon, then you probably need to watch this video. It's very possible that your kit setup, like how high you're sitting, how far back you're sitting, snare height, hi-hat height, angles of things, placement of everything on your kit, it's possible that those very things have been holding you back and causing issues in your practicing, even if you're doing all the right things in your practice sessions. So today we're troubleshooting kit setup and we're basically reworking kit setup by going back to square one and starting with the basics. How should we assemble our kit? How can we make sure we have everything optimized to our body type, our preferences, our playing style? Now, there is, there is a but here, but there is one thing that you physically need to make sure that you're doing well all the time and you're playing and you're performing and practicing or else all of this ergonomic kit setup stuff might not really make much of a difference. And so this is kind of the caveat, the key super important thing that I don't want you to miss. And so we're gonna talk about this too. But of course, don't worry, because I'll show you exactly how to deal with this, how to overcome this and solve this issue. So you're gonna be good to go by the end of this lesson. You can do this, let's dig in. Hey, as we get rolling today, check out my free gift to you in the description. It's a PDF guide called the Fast Fluid Hands Checklist. Unlock your hands for more speed, control, and volume. Harnessing the power of your fingers for more of that control, more of that volume and speed. Eliminating your weak hand, making sure you've got the proper fulcrum and you're getting smooth, loose rebound with your hands that helps you actually play with better time and be more relaxed when you play. And ultimately, that's gonna help you fluidly navigate around the kit, which will help you nail your favorite songs with ease. That's huge. Hand technique is so core. This guide's gonna help you do that and it's gonna provide for you the exact steps bullet points to make sure you're hitting the, the key areas in your practicing that you need to hit. So super practical guide that gets drummers results. So go check that out, Fast Fluid Hands Checklist. Most of the time, when you're playing your kit and things just don't feel right, your setup is the issue. Not all the time, because there are some other things at play and a little of that we're gonna talk about today. But most of the time, if things just aren't feeling right, it's very possible that your setup just isn't optimized for your body. And so, of course, that's what we're getting into today, because if we can fix this, if we can get this right, it's going to help in all areas of your playing, and you're going to feel so much better when you're practicing and when you're playing a gig, especially. All right, so step one is decide how far back from the kick drum you're going to sit. So I've already got my kick drum right here with my pedal and my, my stool. This is my sweet spot. But there are a lot of factors at play here, and there are a lot of things that will affect how far back you sit, how high you sit. And one of those is foot technique. Are you playing heel down or are you playing heel up? I'll show you uh, real quick how those technique differences might affect how I wanna sit. Uh, first off, heel down. This is my, my main way of playing. 99% of the time I'm playing heel down, even if I'm playing loudly. Uh, I've worked to build up a lot of shin strength down here around my ankle. I can play as loud and fast as I need to heel down. That's what I like to do. We're split about 50-50 on that. From the polls that I've done on YouTube and with my email list, about half of you guys are heel up, half are heel down. So we're gonna speak to both of those. I could give you an exact measurement of how high my stool is and how far back the edge of the stool is from the kick drum, but that's not really gonna do you much good because you're probably not the same height as me. I'm almost 6'4", but we're also, we're all different proportions. Our legs are different lengths in relation to our torsos, and we all have different approaches when playing and different comfort zones and different preferred placements of things. And so that's not the point. The point isn't an exact measurement. And if that's what you're hoping I'm gonna give you today, sorry, I don't think that's the most helpful thing for you. But I do wanna talk about ratios and just some things, some factors that will influence your decisions here. So if you're playing heel down, you always, regardless of which technique you're playing, you wanna make sure your leg is forming an angle greater than 90 degrees. I know many of you guys have heard that before from other channels, from here, I've definitely talked about that before. And so most of us understand that that's important, but sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly, what well, does that mean we should sit higher or does that mean we should sit further back? That's where it's kind of left open to your preferred way of sitting. And for me, it's kind of an in-between where I do sit fairly high because I'm tall, but really I'm not sitting that high. I know shorter drummers who sit higher than I do. Instead, I opt to sit pretty far back. I like to sit far back, which means that when I'm setting up on a gig, I've gotta have like six feet of depth, almost a full six feet of depth actually for my drum set, if, especially if I've got a mic out there in front of the kick drum and I wanna make sure my, my stool isn't totally against the wall or falling off the drum riser. 
So it does require a lot of depth because I'm tall and I opt to sit further back. But here's the difference. So if I were to play heel up, then this is a bar stool. In case you couldn't tell, it's a bar stool. <laughs> uh, it's much higher. It's probably, I don't know, six inches higher than my drum stool. And what we'll see here is that if I switch over to the bar stool, but I'm sitting as far back as I was, I know my head's kind of out of the shot here, but I'm sitting as far back as I was when I was on the drum stool, this is a pretty far reach, right? Common sense, if you're sitting just as far back but higher, it's gonna to be too far. So if I were to play heel up, I could actually sit super high and totally do this, sit on a bar stool, because my leg is still greater than 90 degrees, but I can sit super close and still have that greater than 90 degree angle and feel comfortable. So it all comes to show there's not a right or wrong here. The point is have that comfortable leg angle, whether that means sitting high and sitting close or sitting lower and sitting further back. That is your decision to make. Let's see if I can place this exactly where I had it originally. I think it was, yeah, about right here. I know of shorter drummers who like to sit higher and sit closer. A lot of taller drummers that like to sit lower and further back. It's hard to say what influences those decisions, but play around with that. Play around with sitting higher and closer, lower and further back. You could think of this as the top of your stool needs to be a certain distance from the kick. So obviously if we go higher, we're gonna be moving back this way, you know, kind of like a, an, a curve, where right now my stool is here, but as I go higher, I naturally have to curve toward the drum. In a way, it would be like if you took a stick or a cable or something, here's a cable just for reference. Imagine we, we measure this distance here from kick drum to top of stool, roughly about this far, well, as the stool gets higher, it also has to get closer. Of course, it gets ridiculous at this point as you get this close. But you could think of it that way. We're wanting to maintain a certain distance from the kick drum pedal. So the higher you go, closer you wanna go. It's really just common sense and there's not a right or wrong. So that's why you kinda of have to figure out what works well for you, figure out what's comfortable. Now, the other important thing here is when you're setting up kick drum, kick pedal, thrown, don't put your throne exactly lined up with the kick drum. Like you might notice, so my throne is slightly off. So right edge of my stool, left edge of the stool. If it were centered, then that would actually cause my right leg to not be directly lined up. You have to set up with the mentality of right leg lined up with the kick drum, so you're actually facing this way. You're actually gonna ultimately face towards your snare, that way your left leg can be planted right over here on the hi-hat. And so don't think in terms of facing your kick drum. You want to think in terms of facing this way. And so you want your right leg to be lined up naturally with the pedal, which means stool can be slightly to the left, to your left of where the kick drum is. So at this point, we're ready to bring in the hi-hat because we do want to make sure we get both feet comfortable and we're not having to make any huge compromises with the feet. I have my rug all hashed out here. I've got gaff tape markers where everything needs to go. So I just put my hi-hat without thinking exactly where I know it needs to be ultimately. But if I were to think about this in terms of my feet being comfortable, really it'd be about right here. Because you want both legs to be sitting there comfortably the way that they would be if you're just sitting in a chair. Like if you sit down in a chair, what feels comfortable, what feels natural? You're not gonna sit there with one leg way out here and one leg back here. You're roughly gonna have your feet the same distance from you. So ideally, that's what you want to do, where if right foot's out here, left foot's almost as far out too, and so both pedals are kind of at the same spot, then you just drop the snare in the middle. But it's not always that simple, because we've also got to think about the symbol placement here, where are the hi-hats, because we're going to be hitting them, and so we have to find that sweet spot and find that balance. We'll talk about that a little more once we put the snare in place, but I'll give you my, my short answer here. For me, was that I had to pull the hi-hat about an inch and a half, maybe two inches closer than my left foot wanted it, so that it was where my hands wanted it. And also, to talk hi-hat height makes a little more sense with the snare added in. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll add the snare in, which is just going to be situated between our legs. And actually, the way my snare stand is, I'm basically wedging it in between here, where there's just enough space the, the legs of the snare stand are almost hitting each pedal because I want to have my pedals as close in as I can get them. So my legs are, my knees are almost hitting my snare, but not quite. And that's with a 14 inch snare, by the way, which is standard size. This feels about right. And I do have my carpet marked. And so I know I've got it exactly where I had it. But the thinking here is that I want the snare right here, 
right in the center. So I'm literally facing the direction of my snare. I'm not facing toward the camera right now. I'm not facing toward the kick drum. I'm actually facing right here. And so my right leg is going straight towards the kick drum, toward the camera. The left leg is going straight toward the hi-hat. And so those are the directions, the angles you want to think about. And because your snare is your primary instrument on the kit, that's what you're going to play the most probably, especially if you're playing rock and you're playing backbeats. So you want it to be comfortably placed. Now, there's a lot of subjective territory here, and I know everybody's different about this. But for me, I like to have the rim of the snare about two inches above my right knee. I talked about this recently in a video about rim shots, where we talk about snare placement for playing rim shots well. This might be more like an inch and a half. An inch and a half, maybe two inches above my right knee when my foot is on the bass drum pedal. That's my sweet spot for height. And then my sweet spot for angle, uh, I wouldn't know this if it wasn't for the fact that it's so easy to measure it with an iPhone. But if you've got the measure app uh, on, a, on an iPhone, then you can lay your phone on here and it'll tell you the, how, what the angle of the snare is. And so I thought I'd figure out what that was for fun. And it turns out my snare is always angled about seven to nine degrees, probably usually about eight degrees. I don't notice that much of a difference between seven, eight, nine, but roughly right around there is how I want my snare angled. And I like it angled exactly toward my center. I don't want it tilted to the left, tilted to the right. Some drummers do. That's why I say this is subjective. And if you're playing traditionally, you probably want it tilted that way. Uh, some drummers like to have it tilted more this way because of playing backbeats with the left hand. But my thinking with that is that I'm gonna play an equal number of backbeats with my right hand if I'm playing grooves like this, or I'm doing snare cadence stuff, or if I'm playing a fill where I wanna smack a rim shot with the right hand and reach over to the toms. I wanna make sure I can play a rim shot equally well on this part of the drum as I can on this part. And so that's why I want it balanced left to right, tilted toward me. So you may agree 100%, you may disagree 100%, but I'm throwing that out, out there at you as here's how I do it. And it's just very commonsensical to me, but again, we're all different. And so no hard feelings if you've got another idea for how you wanna adjust your snare, but that's what I like doing. So back to hi-hat. So hi-hat placement and height, basically what I ended up doing and finding my perfect hi-hat placement which I explained a few minutes ago was getting where my foot wanted it and then coming about two inches closer. I landed on that because I wanted the hat slightly overlapping the snare right at about a 45 degree angle. So if I'm facing this way, I'm facing this way, my hats are about a 45 degree angle, so 1030. If this is a clock, here's 12 o'clock, my hats are overlapping slightly at 1230. And so that's the perfect spot for doing the crossover, playing them here, or for some other positions that I'll show you. And so that's how I landed on that. And in terms of hi-hat height, because I like to play the hi-hats more on top than deep down, I like to have them lower. I don't like doing high hi-hats because if they're super high, I'm having to play more on the edge, which is fine if I'm playing like a big, loud, heavy rock groove and going at it, that's cool. But if I wanna play something that's a little bit more chill, that's like a quicker funk kind of timekeeping, like, Any kind of groove like that, especially if it's fast. You can't do that if you're way down here. And so you have to have this stick angle where the stick is angled just enough that the tip doesn't hit the top of the cymbal and instead you're hitting the edge with the neck. And so just a stick placement tip. If you're trying to play quick hi-hat 16ths, position your stick about here. That way you're striking the edge of the hats with the neck of the stick rather than the shoulder or the shaft and you're at the shallowest possible angle you can get before the tip actually makes contact with the top hi-hat. In order to do that comfortably without having to lift up, you've gotta actually have your hats fairly low. And mine, in relation to the snare right here, they're about the height of the H, butt end to H on a Vic Firth 5B or 5A stick, which is probably about six inches, I guess. I don't have a ruler here. Uh, I also don't have a metric ruler for those of you guys that use metric system, but roughly you can see it's not quite halfway up a stick. That's about the height of my hi-hats in relation to my snare. And that's something that I've fine-tuned and tweaked over the years and gradually landed on this. But sometimes, sometimes as far as stick placement, so most of the time I'm playing this way, but sometimes I'll actually shift out here to get my right hand out of the way. Because depending on what I'm playing, it can be really nice to just just to get right stick out of the way rather than being here.
I can still play most anything right here, but if it's a super quick, busy right hand part, and especially a busy left hand part with back beats and rim shots, it can be really nice to free things up and open things up a bit. But there's also a technique that I talked about exclusively in a recent lesson. I'll link it in the, in the description below. The windshield wiper motion. And that's where, whenever you're playing on the hats, you want to create an artificial stick height that is essentially a drawbridge that opens up that allows the left hand to move like this. So that if you're playing backbeats, I wasn't playing that loud just now. I'm sitting here, no in-ears in, just the sound of the drums in the room, which would be super loud if I were playing hard. I was actually playing that pretty lightly, but I was allowing the stick to just bounce, establishing a motion. Just gently, kind of this wiggling kind of motion, just letting the stick move within my hand, wiggle it up, let it fall down, wiggle it back up. This kind of lazy motion, and what that does is it keeps you from staying choked down here. If I were to do this, my left stick would constantly be running into the right, and so th those kinds of tangle up issues, ain't nobody got time for that. So when you're playing, allow some natural stick height here. I say natural even though I just said artificial. <laughs> you are creating natural stick height when you do this motion. You're artificially creating it, but it is a natural rebound, floating kind of motion. And so right stick's always out of the way for left stick to come up. Now, if you're playing faster, You can still do that, you just have to be a little more intentional. And lift a little higher before beats two and four whenever you're gonna hit the snare. So that does take some intentional practice, but it's well worth doing so that you can be comfortable and right here and crossed over and not have stick collisions. But sometimes I like to just cheat, move over to here. And just do that instead, or open-handed. No harm in doing that either. You could do open-handed or whatever you wanna do, and that is certainly gonna influence your setup also. I'm showing you how I set up my kit so you've got some tips and pointers for how to do yours, but know that you are a different body type, you are a different drummer playing different styles with different tastes, preferences, and ways of playing, so know that all those things are gonna affect your decisions here. Now, if you've done this, if you've got your kick drum, thrown, snare, hats in place, that's like 90%, honestly. Like this is the bulk of all of this, because all we gotta do now is just move in the other elements around this, and they're honestly not nearly as important as this. Because we spend so much time here, especially if you're playing groove-based music or if you're playing a lot of rock, then you're gonna play a lot of groove stuff here. Of course, if, you, if you're playing rock or if you're playing worship, if you're playing at your church, you might be doing a lot of tom stuff too. So toms are certainly important, but you've gotta make sure your feet are comfortable, your legs are comfortable, because that affects your balance. The way that you have your legs positioned on the kit that affects how well you feel balanced as a drummer. And if you're trying to do heel up, but you're trying to sit low, either you've got to build a lot of core strength or you're probably not going to feel that balanced versus when I pulled the bar stool over here a minute ago, I could sit here and play heel up and it doesn't require as much core strength because I'm sitting higher. So I'm able to achieve that balance better. So that's so important. That's very core, making sure that you get your feet, your legs comfortable. That way, literally your core is comfortable and you're feeling balanced. Then you can center everything else around that. So. I hope you've been following along with me. Maybe once you've watched this video, go, go over to your kit and follow along with me and break down your kit, strip everything away and reset it up in light of everything that we're going through today. So that you can start off with getting feet comfortable, sitting at the right height, right distance, and then move everything in around that. Sometimes just stripping it down and going piece by piece helps so much. I even had a one-on-one -on -one coaching student one time who had never done that before and I encouraged him to just take his kit apart, sit there, piece it together this way, and he was so happy he had done that. It helped him so much because he discovered problems in his setup that he didn't know were there originally. It's interesting how this kind of brings things to light that you didn't notice before, like potential issues. It makes you think through them, and so that's why this is very worth doing. So now we wanna start bringing in the other items. I'm gonna bring in the toms first, uh, especially the floor tom. And I'm just gonna sit it as I smack my overhead. I'm just gonna sit it where I know I want it because I've got my tape marks here, and so I'm gonna set it on the tape and just give you some of my thinking behind where it is. So I pretty much want my floor tom the same distance away as the snare. That's roughly where it is. It might be a tiny bit further, but roughly it's right here in this ballpark. I like having my floor tom lower than my snare because I've always run into that issue, and this is kind of a sloppiness in playing issue that 
I think I've hopefully I've overcome. I don't do, I don't think I do this as much as I used to. But sometimes when you come down on the floor time, if you're not careful, it's easy to smack a finger, like a finger lamb between the stick and the rim of the tom, and that hurts like crazy. Uh, when that happens on a gig, it's just the worst thing. And if you're playing with a bigger floor tom, that tends to happen. Like if you've got a huge 18 inch floor tom, it's very easy when you've got the tip in the center, the rim is about right there where your index finger might be. So you have to really be careful. With this drum, this is a 14 inch tom, so it's really not an issue. But with bigger toms, I've always run into that. And so I like to have my tom low enough and angled enough that I know I can avoid that. So that if I play a rim shot on my snare, then flip over to the tom, keeping my hand roughly at the same height, I know that I can easily get the center of the tom, get a nice tone without accidentally playing a rim shot on the floor tom or without hitting my hand on anything. And so you just wanna think logically here. You're gonna be doing a lot of back and forth between floor tom and snare, especially if you're playing rock. And so just make sure it's at a comfortable spot. So in my case here, my floor tom's about an inch lower than my snare. And so you might find that to be your sweet spot. It's angled toward me, again, it's angled toward my center about the same amount that my snare is angled. So it might be that seven, eight, nine degree angle. And rack tom. So this is kind of an interesting thing to talk about because most people are gonna mount their rack tom off of the kick drum because it's just easier, it's simpler that way. And my kick drum is capable of doing that. I could mount my rack tom off my kick if I wanted to. Uh, but the reason I don't is because I'm so tall. Look at the distance between my rack tom and where I would mount it. That's like 12 inches almost. So I would need a crazy mount that would have a lot of stress on it and put a lot of stress on the, the shell, I would think, of the, of the kick drum, having it way out here on this arm. And so it just doesn't make sense. Remember earlier I was saying because I'm tall, I opt to sit further back rather than super high. I'd rather sit at a normal height but sit further back. And so in doing that, that means everything else has to be pretty far forward. When you look at where I have the snare and the floor tom position in relation to the front of the kick, there's a lot of space there. And if you're shorter or you're sitting higher, that's gonna look totally different for you. But for me, I like having my rack tom in its own basket stand so that I can get it exactly where I want it. And so I like to get my rack tom as close to my snare as I can get it. Like it's, there's like this much space between some hardware here. And so I wanna get it close, and I don't want it to be super high. You know what drives me nuts is when I play on a house kit where I can't get the rack tom low enough because maybe the kick drum's too big. So I like to get the rack tom down kinda of low, and honestly, I'd be okay with this being even lower than it is right now. But I don't wanna have it the height of the snare. Some drummers like to go super low. I'm not a fan of that, because when you're having to reach out further, you can have something closer by having it higher. If this were lower, then I'd technically be having to reach around more to get to it. And so this is really my sweet spot where my rack tom is about four inches higher than the top of my snare right here. And it's the only drum that's not angled toward me. I say only drum because these two are angled toward my center. My rack tom is really angled down this way, which has always made sense to me because if I'm reaching up to hit the rack tom, I'm either coming from the snare or from the floor tom. And so you wanna roughly average that out. And so I literally have my rack tom tilted down toward right here, which is halfway between coming this way to get to the floor tom and coming this way to get to the snare. And so that's my logic. This wasn't something I like sat here and thought through. It kind of just happened over time. And I realized, oh, well this makes sense because I'm either going down to here or going to here. And so that's just the way I want it to be. And so that might affect your decision too. Where are you going from your rack tom? Where are you going to get to your rack tom? So let that affect how you have it tilted and how high you have it. Also, uh, it would be fair to note that these are smaller than usual drums. These are not standard drum sizes here on this kit. This is a 20 inch kick drum. This is a 12 inch rack, 14 inch tom I mentioned earlier, and of course 14 inch snare. When you have a smaller kick drum, it makes it a lot easier to get your rack tom where you want it. I used to play on a house kit a bunch that was this huge like Bonham style kit. Awesome kit, really fun to play. The kick drum was 24 inches, so it came up to about here. <laughs> and the rack tom was 14 inches. The rack tom was the size of my snare. It was huge, and so getting the rack tom where it wasn't hitting the, the kick drum and where it wasn't crashing into the hats, and then getting that big floor tom, it also had an 18 inch floor tom too. Getting all that position was such a pain. Even as a tall person, getting big drums positioned where I can reach them is hard. And so I love having smaller drums. And it's possible if you are shorter 
and you've struggled with getting things exactly where you want them because you just can't, like your snare will not go any closer to the kick drum or your rack drum won't come any further down here, you could opt to get smaller drums. Most likely the first drum set you bought or your primary drum set is probably standard sizes where this is maybe a 13, uh, maybe this is a 16, your kick drum's probably a 20, two inches higher than mine. And most of the time you don't run into too many issues with that. But again, if you're shorter, next kit you buy, you might wanna explore getting smaller drums. Might actually save you some money, depending on what kit you're buying, you might save some money by getting smaller drums. But as a side note, smaller drums are often easier to tune, they've got more tone, and they're easier to fit in the back seat of a Honda Accord, which is what I've driven uh, all of my adult life. And so I, I like the simplicity of it. And so I'm a big fan of small drums. And so that does help me get things exactly where I want them. And that would afford me the possibility of going lower with my rack time. I've got two inches to spare here before the rim hits the hoop of the kick drum. And so I can get this exactly where I want it, which is great. Another side note, most of the time when you've got a rack time in a basket stand, it doesn't ring out beautifully like that. I love, this one's got so much tone. And I also love the sympathetic buzz from the snare. I think that completes a tom sound. I love these drums. Uh, maybe you do or maybe you don't. Personal preference always when it comes to drum tuning and drum sound. But you have to be careful about what kind of basket stand you put your rack tom in. This one is in one of those DW lightweight stands, the 6000 series hardware. And because it's a lightweight, almost flexible stand, it allows for more resonance. If I were to put this tom in the heavy DW3000 stand I have my snare on, it would choke it out and it wouldn't ring like that. And so that is something to be aware of. If you go the option of custom positioning your rack tom on its own basket stand, you have to be careful of what kind of stand you put it in because not all stands are equal. I did a video comparing stands doing this exactly a while back. I'll link that in the description so you can check it out for more info. Um, of course, you could also rack mount it. Some drummers like to have a rack and rack mount things. I've never been a big fan of that because it kind of diminishes the portability and the quick teardown. Also because I'm a minimalist and I don't have a lot of items on my kit and so it doesn't make a lot of sense for me. All right, so now we're just gonna bring in the cymbals, which in my case is literally, if I can reach it over here, literally just a ride cymbal and a crash cymbal. I'm just gonna get these roughly into place and then explain a little of my thinking as far as where I'm putting things. All right, so right now they're too far away. <laughs> it's funny how you pull them in and it's like, that's probably about where they're gonna go and you sit down and whoa, that's way too far back. So in light of my hash marks over here, this needs to go about right here. I can't see my other tape mark back there. There it is. This actually, this one goes slightly on this side of the overhead stand. You always, by the way, wanna get your drums in position before you deal with any mic stands. Like if you're setting up on a gig and you've got mic stands or you're setting up in your studio, Get everything where you want it, then let the sound guy put the mics in place, then set up your stands. I'm trying to navigate around my overhead stand that I know can live right here, but ordinarily I would put in the overhead stands last. Because I'm using this ride cymbal as both a ride and a crash, I like having it a little bit higher, a little more angle. I've got room to hit it as a crash cymbal without the butt end of the stick hitting the floor tom, but I can also play on top and I'm not having to lift up my arm too high. It's far enough away that I can play down here. with my arm in a relaxed position, but it's close enough that I can come up here and play on the bell. And I could choose which side I wanna play on. I could even come up here to the top. And so it's at a, a good sweet spot where I can reach out if I need to, or I can stay relaxed right here. It's a 20 inch cymbal, by the way. If you've got a bigger cymbal, then you might wanna go a little further back um, this is about as small of a ride as you would ever encounter. And so if I did put a bigger symbol here, I would slide it back just a little bit. You also want it to be far enough out of the line of fire here between the toms that you don't hit it accidentally, but that you can get to it easily from each tom. And so it's kind of just a triangle here, just a natural, not any specific kind of shape, honestly, but it's just out of the way, but close enough to get to. And then this crash up here, so it is a little far away right now. If I put it onto my tape marks, this should be where it goes. Um, looks about right. Basically, what I like to do is have it about as close to my hi-hat rod as I can get it without it hitting that. And then I'm also kind of navigating. I've got my mic I normally put on my rack tom that clips onto the, the hoop. And so my 18-inch my crash here is always situated exactly between those things. 
And so there is kind of a fine balance. And if I were to do bigger cymbals, if I had like a 24 inch ride and like a 20 inch crash, yes, that would change some things. I'd have to back up just a little bit and probably play around with what I do with my Rack Tom mic. But with this setup, I like to get these cymbals in pretty close, but you do have to be careful with crash cymbals to not have them so close that you're always hitting them this way. You don't always wanna be hitting them with the shaft. A lot of times you get a better crash sound if you hit more with the shoulder, like right here, and they don't swing around as much. It's kind of interesting, if you, put your, if you place your stick this way, it tends to move the cymbal more than it needs to be moved, but you can get more sound without all the movement if you're about right here. I've done some videos on that before, I'll link those in the, in the description too, where we talk about getting the best sound quality out of every element of your kit. Of course, that also influences your decisions of how far to tilt the cymbals, and I don't know exactly what the tilt is here, but both cymbals are tilted more than my snare for sure. It's probably like a 15 degree tilt or so. Uh, so that they're, they're tilted toward me. Uh, the ride cymbal is tilted exactly to about my center. And then crash is kind of tilted a little over to my right. But it's all in terms of we're thinking about where are we coming from when we hit them? Where are we going to after we hit them? And it's not something that you have to overthink. And it's really not something you can mess up, honestly. Just make sure you're hitting your cymbals. When you're crashing them, when you're hitting on the edge, make sure your angle's not too steep. Kind of like what we talked about with the hats. That way you don't put too much stress on the cymbals and that way you get better sound quality out of them also. And so really you can't go wrong at this point. If you get your legs comfortable, you get your snare where it needs to be and you're good to go with kick snare hats, everything else is just add-ons to that. And you can fine tune your tom position, fine tune your cymbals. You really can't go terribly wrong. You're gonna be fine. And so definitely focus on the feet first, getting those things comfortable and you can come back and gradually fine tune the other things. Now, a final point, and I mentioned earlier, this needs to be happening or else you can get your kit perfected. <laughs> you could have everything exactly where it needs to be, where it's feeling great, but still your playing doesn't feel good and you're not quite comfortable because maybe you haven't mastered fluid grip that allows you to navigate fluidly around the kit. That's kind of the caveat here. The one little thing you wanna make sure that you're, you're doing well in order for all of this to work but it's simple and I've got a whole bunch of lessons and resources for you if this is something you need to dig into. It all starts with that loose grip where if you've got the stick moving freely within your hand like this, then you can move around the kit with the intention of where am I going next? You can move in arc motions. And so every day practice your singles with your loose grip so that you can establish this bouncing motion which lends itself to these arc motions around the kit. When you're able to move in arcs, you're able to hit each drum square in the middle and get great sounds. You can also use wrist twisting motions as you move from drum to drum, switching from a palms down grip to a thumbs up grip so that you can move more quickly. That's very important, practice that. Intentionally practice applying your technique to the kit by doing that and saying, all right, I'm gonna grip palms down on the snare with the right hand, flip over to thumbs up to go over to the floor tom. And practice doing this at low volumes too, where you're letting the sticks just float along. Practice doing it loudly, big arcs, but also practice playing quietly, but still having stick height. It's kind of the artificial stick height thing we talked about on hi-hats, where you're just letting the stick bounce naturally, you're giving it a little bit of lift so you can move in smooth arcs. Instead of, that'd be terrible. Just allow a little bit of headroom there. Allow a little bit of natural rebound to happen and lift the sticks a little bit for a little bit of artificial rebound. That'll help you in navigating. Lots more detail on that in other lessons, which I'll link in the description below so you can go more in depth with that. Main point is get your kit set up. Follow everything we went through today. Take action on this. Get your kit comfortable. Find your perfect throne height, throne distance. Position everything accordingly. But make sure that the number one thing you're practicing is that loose rebound and practice applying that loose motion from drum to drum, cymbal to cymbal, so that you're getting high quality sounds out of your drum, out of your drums and out of your cymbals. And that way you're feeling comfortable as you're playing and you're able to relax and move in these fluid motions. Remember, you want your sticks moving in accordance with where they're going next. You wanna hit with the mindset of where am I going from here? So you're moving in arc motions 
you're thinking lazy, loose, relaxed, especially when you're playing slow, it'll help your time, it'll help your feel. That's huge, focus on the hands. That's gonna be a big part of your practicing once you've got your kit set up, squared away, and that's gonna help you feel so much more comfortable. These are the secrets to feeling at home on your drum set for sure. So in light of that, go download that guide I told you about back at the beginning of the video, Fast Fluid Hands Checklist. Make sure you're holding your sticks the right way. You'll see that via a bunch of pictures and clear step-by-step -step bullet points. You'll eliminate your weak hand. That's big. We want you to eliminate your weak hand. Harness the power of your fingers for maximum speed and control. Fingers play such an important role here. This guide is gonna help you with getting fingers squared away. You'll be able to nail your favorite songs thanks to that loose, relaxed ability to navigate around the kit. It's gonna help you relax when you play your songs and focus on the music instead. And of course, it's gonna give you the exact core steps to master hand technique. This is how you get rolling. A big thing a lot of times is just knowing the next step. And so if your next step was getting your, your setup squared away, awesome, you've done that now. Maybe your next, next step is to get your hand technique squared away. So go download the guide, it's free, total no-brainer. Take that to your practice room, put it on your iPad, print it out, whatever you wanna do. That's gonna help you out so much. It's been helping a bunch of drummers really get their hands more loose and relaxed so they can play what they wanna play and have total hand freedom. That's awesome. Know that you can do all of this. You can do all of this, follow along with me, take action on this, you will grow as a drummer. I believe in you. Hey, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe. Go check out some of the other non-glamorous videos here. I mentioned a bunch of additional lessons that take you more in depth with a lot of the little things we've touched on today. So be sure to check those out. And all of you who have been loyal followers of the channel, thank you so much for hanging out with me. It's so exciting to hear the results you guys get from this stuff. And so keep taking action, keep working hard at this and practicing. You are awesome fellow non-glamorous drummers, so keep up the good work. As always, thank you for watching. You can do this, you can become the drummer you're meant to be. Stay non-glamorous, I will see you on the next lesson.